Hi, I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about ski boots. Everybody's favorite subject. My ski boots hurt, they're painful, all that kind of stuff. Quite honestly, you can make ski boots very comfortable by knowing a few things. So hopefully I'm going to help you through some of that, give you a little bit of technology that uh, is in the ski boot world right now. Um, but first off, we're not going to talk about ski boots. We're going to talk about what you wear on your foot in the ski boot. It is super, super important not to wear just like a cotton sock or a, a, a basic sock or a thick wool sock. What is important about ski socks is that they be very thin, um, and I'll explain that in a second, and that they be made out of materials that will wick sweat off of your feet. So thin and wicking is very, very important. And the thing with that is um, when, when the uh, sock wicks the sweat off of your foot and puts it into the liner, you won't get a cold foot. It's very similar to when you get out of the shower, you're soaking wet until you uh, dry yourself off, you feel cold. So if you can keep your feet dry, you'll keep your feet warm. The thin part, how that keeps your foot warm. Well, you've got all these little bumps and uh, nodules and all that kind of stuff on your foot. So when the boot is designed to grab a hold of all these things, if you pad it up with a really thick sock, what ends up happening is you end up over tightening the buckles of the boot and then you end up cutting off circulation. Um, right down this part of your foot is where majority of your blood is flowing into your feet. So if you clamp these buckles down like crazy, you are gonna cut circulation off to your feet and I don't care how warm your socks are, you're gonna be very, very cold. So the secret is nice thin sock, the boot can grab a hold of the contours of your foot, and then uh, don't tighten the buckles down too much. Tighten the buckles down so that they're grabbing a hold of your foot, but not crushing it. Most people make the mistake of tightening their boots too much. So that's kind of socks out of the way. The other thing I'm gonna talk about before we talk about boots is footbeds. The footbeds that come in a ski boot, unfortunately, it's just the ski industry, it's the way it is, but unfortunately, they are just a flat piece of felt. They've got very little support, if any. And a, a, a good footbed will give you a nice base to stand on. It'll make sure that your heel isn't wandering side to side. Footbeds uh, generally aren't that expensive. And if you need to, just down price the boot a little bit so that you have enough left over to buy a set of footbeds. So, like I was saying, the heel cup here is designed so that you don't wander off to the sides of the liner. It's not just like a flat piece of felt. You've got an arch here holding you from shifting forward in the boot and supporting your arch properly. And then you've got a metatarsal head cushion. So metatarsal and heel cushion. So those just give you a little bit of cushioning uh, for your foot because it is getting squished down in the boot a little bit. Um, these things are usually um, uh, fit to different sizes so that you'll have say A, B, C, D, E and each size will cover say like uh, men's 8 to 10 and then you just have to trim the footbed. The neat thing about, about this company's footbed is that they take into consideration two things that are very important. One is the height of your arch. If you picture kind of like walking on a dock after you've gone swimming, you leave footprints. That shows how high or low your arch is. So we gauge your arch. We've got a little pad that you stand on. It transfers the heat and lets us know what kind of arch you have. Next up to bat, your leg alignment. Are you bow-legged? Are you knock-kneed? Or do you have a straight, uh, uh, straight legs? That's going to affect the type of footbed that you need. So for example, on this system, if you are a B foot, uh, foot uh, shape or profile, and you have, let's say, your knock-kneed, so you're a B3, B3 works out to a medium profile. If you were some other, com uh, some other combinations, you could be a high profile or a low profile. So this is what's called a semi-custom footbed. Um, it's a big upgrade for any boot, um, and I highly recommend it. Now let's get into the boots. I think we should start at liners. Let's start at liners. So liners are one of the critical points in the boot. Um, that's the piece that's gonna touch your foot next. So you've got your ski sock in there, you got your footbed in there. The liner is the part that sits inside the shell. So this is the liner of this boot. Um, this is an intuition liner, so it's a very heat moldable liner. Heat moldable liners are very 
common in the industry. There's lots of heat moldable liners out there. They do vary in how much they heat mold. Um, some do a little bit and a company like Intuition does a lot. It heat molds a ton. Feels kind of crispy when you first try it on, but once you've heat molded it, it's contoured exactly to your foot. So the liner's job and not the socks job is to keep your foot warm. So this is designed to keep your foot warm. This is a closed cell foam so that it traps all the heat in your foot. Intuition's are actually a really cool Canadian story. Uh, the guy that uh, basically designed Intuition's used to work on the rigs. He uh, wrapped the pipes in Intuition material. Intuition material uh, holds heat extremely well and it's moldable. So he decided to make a pair of uh, liners out of that material that holds heat incredibly well and molds incredibly well. Put them in his snowboard boots and he was blown away at the performance and he no longer works on rigs. Uh, so that's the intuition story. What you're going to notice about most liners is that in the heel pocket here is where you have your most padding so it should fit quite tight in there. When you're buying brand new boots your toe should be coming near to the end. And that's where we're gonna bring up sizing. So sizing a boot, it's very important to do a shell test. Shell test is putting your foot inside the shell because the shell, it's not gonna give much in length. Well, it will give none in length. Um, so when you purchase a boot, you need to know if the shell fits your foot. The liner's gonna break in and the liner's going to change its fit to your foot. The shell is the important thing to size your foot to. So there's what's called a shell test. When you put the liner into the boot, um, basically what you're gonna find is that your toe should be touching the end of the boot. And when you flex forward in the boot, your toe should just come off the end, if not be lightly brushing the end of the boot. If it's not feeling like that, chances are you're buying a boot that's too big for you. So don't make the mistake of buying a boot that's too big. There is break-in that needs to happen, and when that break-in happens, you gain extra room. So be careful of that. Now we'll talk a little bit about different styles of shells. Um, one thing that makes this boot extremely unique uh, is that it is a distortion flex design. So what that means is that all the stiffness of the boot is built into this tongue area. As the boot flexes forward, the stiffness of the tongue is what affects how hard you can flex into the boot and support you. There is no rigid stop. And what I mean by that is that if you look at a overlap boot, see the way the cuff overlaps around, so one cuff, second cuff overlaps, as you pivot forward, this eventually bottoms out on this part. When that happens, you get that sudden stop and then the shell is gonna distort slightly. So the neat thing about distortion uh, free designs are that they're exceptionally good in the park, exceptionally good for moguls, exceptionally good for taking hits continuously, like big hits continuously. So they're a very smooth flexing boot. The benefit to a fo uh, overlap entry boot, because there's some good stuff about them as well, is that they're very powerful skiing boots. That's why you see them in the downhill race circuit. You won't see a pair of these in the downhill race circuit, but you'll see lots of pairs of overlap. They'll always be four buckle, they'll have tons of support. So that's the basic difference between overlap entry and distortion uh, free design. Next up to bat, we'll just talk about some of the features that come on boots these days. There are boots that are very um, user friendly in terms of being able to tour in the backcountry and ski on the ski hill. This happens to be this boot has a hike mode built into it, so you free that up and the cuff is now free to move. You push that forward and it locks into ski position. So whether you're using that for just walking around the resort and being comfortable, or whether you're using that in the backcountry, same feature. This boot uh, uses a three buckle design with a power strap. So three buckle designs are slightly less powerful, but they're a little bit more comfortable uh, in terms of uh, for, for the long day. Uh, they don't put as much pressure up on the calf and they don't put as much pressure on the sensitive areas right in here. So, uh, next up to bat, this boot has the ability to run tech. And tech is this. Tech is a binding that hooks in on there for touring up. So it's got the ability to run the lightest backcountry touring bindings out on the market. 
on weight, boots have gotten a lot lighter. If you haven't tried on a new pair of boots in the last probably four or five years, you're gonna notice that your boots are a lot heavier than the boots out there nowadays. They've gotten a lot lighter. Just makes it easier for walking around the resort, less leg fatigue, really nice. Another thing that's happening is soles are changing. These are grippy rubber soles, similar to like a Vibram sole. Um, Basically, the nice thing about that is walking around in the resort, you have tons of grip. You go onto a floor uh, that's smooth, you've got more grip. Up and down stairs, you've got more grip. So, uh, soles are changing and there's different styles of soles. With that, make sure that your sole is compatible with the binding. So that's something to be aware of these days, that the sole is compatible with the ski binding because not all soles are compatible with all ski bindings. Um, you know what? That is the majority of what I wanted to talk about. But if you have any questions, pop into your local ski shop. They'll be more than happy to answer questions, fit you up, and get you out there and get you comfortable. The last point that I'm going to go over is if your boots are uncomfortable, the boots that you have right now, there is ways to fix that. There's, we have things called boot punches. We can heat the plastic and actually punch the shell of the boot to give more room. It's usually up in the forefoot that people are getting their foot kind of squished like this. There, any ski shop, or most ski shops I should say, will have the ability to punch out that boot and make that boot fit your foot a lot better, if not perfectly. So just keep that in mind that you can make your boots more comfortable. Any ski shop can help you out with that. Um, thanks for watching. This has been Gear Up. And I'm Mike Steven. I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about goggles. Uh, and the first thing I want to go over with goggles is care and maintenance of your goggles. A lot of people think that there isn't much to them, but uh, goggles are quite expensive and hopefully I'll give you a few tips that extend the life of your lenses and uh, allow you to keep wearing the goggle and have great vision for longer. So first off, you, your goggle comes in a microfiber bag, like just a little bag. Keep, keep it in that bag at all times when it's not on your face. If you're not, uh, if you do have a microfiber bag and want to go to the next level of protection, there's things like this. Uh, so it's a fleece lined goggle bo box, allows you to put your goggle in a box, it's armored, you can kind of throw it in your gear bag and you can trust that your goggles are going to be in good shape. The other thing that's kind of uh, a little bit newer in the industry, it's kind of neat, uh, I saw it in the military first, but is uh, these uh, uh, goggle socks. So it just goes over the front of the goggle and uh, you can have that on it when you're not using it. It's just something that you can take off real quick, throw it in your pocket. You can also use it as a, as a cleaner. Most of the goggle socks are, uh, you're able to wipe off because they're um, basically a lint-free cloth, so they won't leave any residue, won't leave anything on the lens. Okay, so that's kind of just protecting it in terms of when it's not in use. Once it gets into use, there's all sorts of things that happen. Uh, my favorite is uh, when you hit the snow and uh, there's tons of snow out there and your goggles are just getting packed on a deep pow day. Um, you get to the lift and they're starting to fog up a little bit and there's a little ice on them. The first thing that you do is you take your goggle off, you put it into your jacket, let it completely thaw out Goggles lenses are weakest when they're wet and foggy and uh, basically they, they absorb the moisture and it softens the material. Um, so put it in your jacket, wipe it out and wipe the water off versus scratching the ice off. When people scratch ice and snow off their goggles, they scratch the lens and damage the lens. Uh, I get asked quite often, are there lenses that are just impervious to scratching and stuff like that? There isn't. Um, uh, they could use glass lenses, but the problem with glass lenses is being sports, you don't want those crash, uh, smashing into your face because uh, that wouldn't be safe. <laughs> so 
the other thing that you can do um, is that uh, with it, there's things like these, like squeegees, and it's designed as a squeegee to wipe the water off streak free, very similar to like a, uh, what people use for their windows. There's things like snow erasers. Snow erasers have like a sponge that you can take the water off and then it's got a leather chamois on the back that you can buff out all the little water uh, droplets off the lens and give you a great vision. Now we're gonna talk about fog. So goggles, higher quality goggles will fog less for sure, but there are some things that you can do to help with that. Uh, dressing properly <laughs> and not overheating. If you're overheating massively and you're sweating like crazy, I don't care how high end a goggle you buy, unless you're moving, the goggle will fog up. The moment you stop, the goggle will fog up. So trying to keep your layers proper uh, and not overheating will definitely help uh, with not fogging. The other thing that I find that helps with not fogging is don't put the goggle up onto your head if you're wearing a toque up onto your head because then the steam off your head is just going to fog the goggle. Uh, or up onto a helmet that has vent holes. If you don't have vent holes, it's okay to put it up. Um, when you put it back on your face, it'll just fog for a second while the lens gets used to the temperature on your face. Um, there are some products out there that can help with that too. So there's, there's anti-fog sprays that you can spray onto the lenses uh, of goggles. Make sure that the, what's in the anti-fog spray is compatible with using on goggles because they do have coatings on them and you don't want to damage those coatings. Um, there's also, if you don't want a bottle of liquid, there's things like fog cloths. So it's a cloth that you wipe down the lens with uh, and it'll help it not fog. A little uh, note is that most of your uh, better quality goggles will have two lenses. One lens uh, for cold, the cold coming off the mountain and one lens for the warm coming off your face. So it gives a buffer zone. If those two meet on the same lens, that's when you get fogging. So um, the goggles that have slightly thicker lenses and bigger air spaces in between will help uh, not fog quite as much. Um, there are certain conditions that man, they're just gonna fog. It's like that minus one, it's a deep powder, you're working hard. You know what, you're potentially gonna, you're a little overdressed, you're gonna fog at that point. So that's what you use the other things that I mentioned here to wipe out your goggles, make sure it's in, the, in liquid form when you clean off your goggle. Next, we're gonna go over goggles a little bit. Um, one of the most important things with goggles is fit. You're gonna see like I've got two goggles here and one's smaller and one's bigger smaller faces and bigger faces, whether you be a junior or an adult, uh, smaller faces and bigger faces, the goggle will fit better if you fit it and spend some time, just like trying on shoes, trying on different goggles, make sure it works with your helmet, make sure it works with your face. Uh, you don't want any air gaps in around your nose uh, so that when you're going fast, <laughs> air will be whistling in there. Um, uh, another thing that you're going to, or that a lot of people look for in a goggle is uh, if it doesn't have a really big space between the lenses is good ventilation. That's what these little ports are here for and this port on the top of the lens is here for so that the air can come into the goggle, swirl and get exhausted out the tops and the bottoms. So there's venting in all these places usually on a goggle. So bottom, top, some have some venting along the top, some have some venting in the bottom. This is one of the most vented goggles I know of. Um, and what you wanna do also is keep snow clear of those venting zones. So again, on your chair left, right up to the top, sweeping the air off, or sweeping the snow off of those ventilation areas will help you not fog up. Uh, next up, there's lens technology. And man, there is a ton of lens technology out there right now. Um, they've definitely, uh, they've pulled apart the light spectrum and choosing what light to allow into the goggle, what light not to allow into the goggle. Most goggles that you'll find at a specialty sports shop will block the UVA and UVB, so the dangerous ones that your eyes uh, shouldn't be taking. Um, but then there's other uh, uh, forms of light that are going to help you or hinder. And what you want is you want a lens that is appropriate for the light conditions of that day. So if it's a super overcast day, uh, you're gonna want a low light lens, meaning 
uh, that lots of light can come in through the lens and allow you to see the definition in the terrain. If you go skiing on a socked in day, and uh, uh, you'll definitely notice uh, what's called flat light. And flat light is when you just can't see the bumps in the snow. The lower light lens that you use, the more it will help get rid of that flat light. Also tints in the lenses help with that. Uh, yellow tint or orange tint or amber tint in there helps pull out some definition. One of the things that I do when I try on goggles is I try on goggles and then look at a clothing rack that has a bunch of black clothing on it and see how much definition you can see. So uh, a, a lens that uh, is a little bit nicer will allow you to see more definition. So the other side of the spectrum is too much light coming in. You're up uh, skiing in a place like Whistler on a gorgeous sunny day, you're in the middle of a bowl, so the sun's coming at you from here, the sun's refracting uh, off the snow at you, uh, you're going to have some <laughs> really, really, if you, if you have low light lenses, you're going to be squinting all the time and having a hard time seeing there. So at that point, what you want is you want a lens with a more of a coating on it, and you'll see the, the black iridiums and the fire iridiums, all the different colors uh, that are over top of the lens. Believe it or not, the colors aren't just for the style. The different colors let in different amounts of lights. So depending on how much, how sensitive your eyes are is how much light you'll let in in that situation. So a lot of times people uh, have a couple lenses with them uh, to be able to switch out. So say the day starts out gorgeous and sunny and then moves to low light. It's nice to be able to switch out your lenses. Uh, on that note, one of the things that's changed in the industry uh, huge is on the high-end goggles, fast lens technology. Every goggle can have its lenses changed out. It just takes more time. Uh, there's certain goggles that you do this on the chairlift, and there's certain goggles that you'd probably go into the lodge to do it because it'll take you a little bit of time. Whereas this is some of the fast technology, so it's as quick as you flip that up, out comes your lens. So they're using a combination of a clip and magnets. You'll see the magnet kind of click and pull the uh, lens into place, close the door. So you can switch between a high light and a low light lens extremely quickly. The other thing that I like taking the lens out for is it's really easy to clean them at that point. Uh, take the lens out, you throw it in your jacket pocket, let it, uh, all the snow and ice come off of it and uh, take the water off of it that way. Uh, there's also some kind of neat technology on goggles right now um, that uh, there's magnets here uh, on this brand of goggle and what it does is a balaclava actually magnets right to the goggle. The reason why they're doing that isn't just for coolness factor and to have a seamless, uh, a seamless look to it is that when your balaclava gets underneath your goggle on a cold day so the balaclava is coming up underneath your goggle it can transport moisture from your mouth up into your goggle lens. So by having the magnetic one that's uh, joining to the outside of the frame, you don't get any of that fog from your breath creeping up into your goggles. So kind of a cool design, kind of neat. The other thing that I'd like to mention is, it's a small thing, but it's a thing that makes a big difference. Uh, they've, a lot of the goggles nowadays are sil have silicone on the back of the strap. The benefit of silicone is that the goggle strap doesn't want to slide and move and where you put it, it stays in place. This kind of comes from the motocross industry because if you look at motorbike helmets, they don't have a clip on the back of their helmet. They're trusting this silicone to hold them through all the whoops and jumps and everything else that they're doing. So uh, I find that you can get rid of the clip on the back of your helmet, uh, have your helmet a little bit more clean looking. But uh, yeah, so that's another thing that you can kind of look for in a goggle. There's, there's all sorts of lens technology and I'm not gonna go super deep into that. We've already talked about it a bit, but there is some technologies that allow a wider variation, uh, meaning the lens changes depending on the light that's it's being hit by. So in high light conditions, it darkens slightly. In low, uh, in low light conditions, it brightens slightly. So there's that kind of technology out there. Basically, the sky's the limit with the technology in goggles these days. Unfortunately, so is the price. Um, there's goggles with fans in them and heating systems in them to totally destroy fog. So it's basically like turning on the, the defrost in your car. It's actually got 
<laughs> uh, it heats the actual lens and gets the fog off the lens or another system blows air across the end lens and gets rid of it and it's such a quiet fan that actually uh, kind of going back to the military again the military actually use it it's so quiet um, you don't even hear the fan working but it keeps your goggles completely clear I hope uh, this helps you get out on the slopes and enjoy a little bit more being able to see and be safer out there. I'm Mike Steven and this has been Gear Up.